Hello and a very warm welcome to the programme. Where does foreign aid money really go? It appears that billions and billions of dollars end up in offshore bank accounts. That is, at least according to a recent report from the World Bank. So, what can be done to stop the flow of dirty money? This is Roundtable. And a very warm welcome from me, David Foster. As much as one-sixth of all aid sent to some of the world's poorest countries is stolen. That was the suggestion of a recent investigation by the World Bank. And the more dependent on handouts a country is, the more cash appears to be siphoned off. The World Bank is one of the biggest contributors of aid to the world's poorer nations, lending billions of dollars each year. But a recent report commissioned by the bank itself suggested that some funding is being siphoned off. The paper showed that when countries receive cash from the organization, money also flows into tax havens. When the World Bank disperses aid to a low-income country, the amount of cash in offshore accounts controlled by the country's elites has increased by about 7.5%, according to the paper. The report authors warned that very high levels of aid might foster corruption and institutional erosion. And the release of the paper was not straightforward. Publication was delayed and there were allegations that prompted the departure of the bank's chief economist. But the question still remains, how much aid money is being stolen? Well, as you can see, a, a rather empty round table today. We are sort of self-isolating for obvious reasons, but we do have our experts on this subject. Let's say hello to Will Jordan, reporter working for the Organised Crime and Corruption Reporting Project. He's in London. Alex Cobham joins us, economist and chief executive of Tax Justice Network. He's in Oxford in the UK. And Dr Salvador Bechilme, who's joining us from Leiden, that's in the Netherlands, where he's a lecturer in international relations at Leiden University. Very strange not to have somebody, or at least, well, one or two people with me in the studio, but I do appreciate the fact that you've all made yourselves available in these extraordinary times. Um, one-sixth, I said, Salvador, let me come to you first of all. I said one-sixth of all aid, according to the report, but there was a, a senator in the US, Rand Paul, during a, a nomination hearing a couple of years ago for a secretary of state, he said 70%. Uh, which is the more likely figure? Well, I think it's it depends on what kind of foreign aid are we talking about, because foreign aid is such a big, complex international development endeavor. So it might be... In the, so you have different statistics for foreign aid coming from the World Bank. And coming from the World Bank, there are some studies that, in fact, only... 5% of foreign aid is being subjected to corruption, but there's, there could also be underreporting. You also have bilateral foreign aid, which is the aid given by OECD or high-income countries to low-income countries. You also have foreign aid coming from international development organizations, such as the Red Cross, for right. instance. And you also have philanthropic organizations such as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. But so, so would you say that Tillis, uh, not Tillerson's figure, Rand Paul's figure is, is way out, or could it be somewhere between the 5 6% and that extraordinary 70%? 70% is grossly misstated. I think that's too high for for a particular foreign aid. But I'd like to see the evidence. What I, what my point here is that we have to disaggregate what kind of foreign aid are we talking about, and then we can look into the previous studies that say how much exactly would be the foreign aid that's being misused in which okay. particular time period, in which particular... Time. Alex, we'll come to you in a moment, but, but Will, your, your job is to investigate corruption, and, and 5 to 6 percent, I mean, we're talking about 1 20th of a massive global budget, for it to disappear into tax havens, into foreign bank accounts, wherever they happen to be, is, is a scandal. Why is it not being addressed? Well, in many ways, it is being addressed. Um, there, there's certainly the, the example of this study shows that it's being looked at, and the study records it around 7.5%. But the problem is how immensely difficult it is to enforce. So uh, even if you can establish that this is happening, even if the legislation is in place, the rules are in place to stop it, 
actually tracing assets, proving unequivocally that those are the same assets that were stolen, following a chain of shell companies through half a dozen different countries, all with secretive uh, rules around company ownership and um, bank accounts. Mm. And having the patience and the time to do that is impossible. The, the example of Sani Abacha in uh, Nigeria, they're, they're still now um, take, seizing money and returning money to Nigeria that he stole 30, 40 years ago. Do you reckon it's the neediest companies that uh, find that they're losing the most money generally, Will? Um, the neediest countries is, is possibly the right way to describe them. Another way would be the countries with the weakest institutions, because uh, it is the institutions of state that uh, set the rules and that enforce the rules. Um, and where there are strong institutions, it's much harder to, uh, to steal. In countries with weak institutions, you see uh, a lot of nepotism, a lot of uh, middlemen turning up, um, and the misallocation of budget funds. Mm. Um, and so where you actually see the most corruption is uh, where those institutions can't stop it. If it's any time any one of you wants to say something, feel free, Alex. I'll come to you just so we've heard from every single person. So far, I drew up this little uh, list of my own. Uh, countries feel good about giving. Poorer nations are happy to accept. The elite are happy to siphon it off. And even if there is only a small uh, amount going, small amount of change because of the aid money, uh, those in most need will feel slightly better. So everybody, in a sense, wins. Not as much as perhaps the poorest people might like, but everybody feels slightly good about this. And therefore, there's no need to change the system, is there? <laughs> I'd make two points uh, about this. The first one is that the numbers we've seen from the World Bank actually make aid look pretty good. If 5 7% of what is going into countries in World Bank aid is then being moved into bank accounts, registered bank accounts that are transparently showing this in offshore jurisdictions. So this isn't most likely money that's being stolen. It's money that's being parked for some period but isn't um, necessarily, uh, there's no, not necessarily any corruption involved in that parking. Otherwise, you'd make it much more opaque. Much so, sorry, more... help me with this one. It's put into a, a foreign bank account uh, when it should be in the bank account of the country to which it has been donated, or is this quite well, legitimate to do this, to earn interest? So I don't know. What the World Bank study shows, and, and it's interesting that the World Bank actually tried to suppress this, um, so much so that we, we understand the World Bank's chief economist left because they wanted to defend the, the rights of their researchers. But the World Bank's sensitivity isn't really clear. What the study shows is that each time money goes into country X from the World Bank, something like five or in some cases a bit more uh, percent of that money is in the next quarter shown as an additional holding in uh, bank accounts of citizens of country X in offshore jurisdictions that report that. And data. is that not stealing? That, that's just staying there for a while for legitimate reasons or what? No, I mean, let's be clear. What we're probably talking about on the whole are country uh, companies that are contracting to deliver work using that aid to, to participate in okay. investment projects funded by World Bank aid, saying we're not going to keep all of this money in country because we're only going to use it over a period of time. Now, there may be some siphoning off. There may be middlemen taking a cut, which, again, would be a small piece of that. But we're not absolutely what we're not seeing here is evidence of large scale um, corruption. This is a sign that there's something here we should look at, certainly. But it doesn't say 5% or more of World Bank aid is lost to corruption. That is not the finding okay. here. Well, you were nodding to that. It, it's not necessarily perhaps as bad as was painted in, in the headlines. Well, no, because you, as Alex points out, there's a correlation here between the amount of money coming in and the amount of money going out. But whether it's out permanently um, isn't clear. What it's doing when it's out isn't clear. In many of these countries, uh, the aid money is required to be spent uh, with uh, transparent, uh, legitimate contractors who may not exist in a, in a country. You know, one example I looked at was Liberia, where... Uh, you simply can't contract. Uh, there doesn't exist the capacity in the country to do certain things that you want with the aid money. So that has to be spent on foreign uh, suppliers. And so 
naturally there would be some money coming out. The other point I'd make that is in this study is cites uh, another study that points out that petroleum rents, in money spent in the in the in the uh, the oil industry essentially has leakages, as they call it, money disappearing, of about 15% compared with this at around seven and a half, five. So it's two, two or three times more in the private sector. So in some ways, what this shows is actually the relative success of the aid industry in avoiding theft. You see, I, I, I think you referred to, well, or maybe it was somebody else, but correct me if, if, if I'm wrong here, to the economic elites taking money off, off the top. So is there somebody mm -hmm. in every single country that gets aid more than likely getting rich themselves, or is it the exception rather than the rule? It's a difficult question because in many ways it is the economic elites that are required to manage this money because the people at the top of these institutions, at the top of these companies who will be dispersing the funds in various ways are what you would classify and are what are classified in this study as economic elites. Um, I don't think you can say that all of them are, are, are thieving. What you can say is that uh, it's possible to thieve given the secrecy jurisdictions that exist around the world like uh, Switzerland, Luxembourg, the Cayman Islands. It's certainly possible. The shell companies become, in a sense, the getaway cars for the money uh, that you want to put into them and then steal. Um, but uh, it's clearly not really the rule, it's the exception, because we're looking here at five or seven and a half percent increase in amounts of money going out, not necessarily stolen. Okay, well, you, you wouldn't necessarily want to, to make it that obvious. If you take five percent, then it could be um, less sort of flying in the face of international condemnation, and it's enough for one very rich dictator to make his family slightly. Uh, Richer, uh, and I want to come to you, Salvador, and just mm -hmm. this is something you were quoted as saying. In terms of military and counter-terror aid, my own research mm -hmm. on post-9-11 shows that recipient governments used such aid not only to kill armed non-state rebels, but also civilian activists, political opposition members, and other political dissidents. The question mm -hmm. really is, are people prepared to pay this kind of price just for stability in countries to which they are sending this money? The people are willing to pay, but we also have to understand that the donor governments, as well as the recipient governments and their respective political elites, are willing to engage in increased foreign aid because that foreign aid in itself is fungible. It is prone to corruption. And once, especially in times of security crisis, during times of security crisis, specifically after 9-11, right, a lot of foreign aid has been classified as classified Date, uh, classified budget items. And so, 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 sorry, let me simplify this, if I may. Uh, you get a government, not necessarily the United States, could be anyone, mm -hmm. uh, that is giving money, but in this case it is the United States, that is prepared to put X amount into a country and turn a blind eye to what is going on because it is happy to receive either cooperation or intelligence uh, or, or whatever from that particular country, correct? Mm -hmm. That is correct, yeah. Primarily because also what we have to understand is that donor governments don't look out for prospective recipient governments. Recipient governments actively lobby in potential donor governments' countries, for instance, yeah. to actually receive more increased foreign aid. They make a case, they discursively frame that their own countries deserve some special attention from their prospective governments. And I would like to say that it's a story of interest convergence. The interests of political elites, both in donor and recipient countries, converge. And to some extent, the use of foreign aid could actually harm those vulnerable people in recipient countries. So it's not only weak institutions, as Will um, stated a while ago. It's part of that. But it's also about the political elites. For instance, con um, contractors, let's say USAID also has its own contractors. And therefore, it doesn't necessarily stimulate the local economy in receiving countries. Okay. So, um, yeah. Sorry, Alex, the question was before we went to Salvador, um, how can it be changed? I suppose what we all to ask inside that question is, does it need to be changed? And if so, how? There's, there's a global context here that is highly problematic. And I, I guess I'm slightly worried in this conversation that we might end up blaming the victims, putting the emphasis on lower income countries um, who certainly can do more to protect themselves, but are really not the villains of the piece here. 
you know, the reason that some aid is siphoned off into what we'd call financial secrecy jurisdictions or tax havens is the same reason that much higher amounts of wealth owned by the elites, in that case, we know globally it's about 10 percent, end up in those same secrecy jurisdictions. And the profits of multinational companies in much higher volumes, something like 25 to 30 percent of their profits globally are shifted into jurisdictions like the Netherlands, Luxembourg, Ireland, and so on. Um, and the United States itself, of course, is one of the biggest financial secrecy jurisdictions in the world. The problem and where the power lies is with economic actors, multinational companies, big four accounting firms and big law firms from the richest countries and those high income secrecy jurisdictions like the US, but also like Cayman, that provide uh, cover for people to shift money of different forms in. And of that, corruption from aid mm. is, a, is a tiny percentage. But, but weren't, weren't the, the, the British authorities, which I'm obviously closely associated with because I, I'm British and I look at that, um, weren't they supposed to be doing something about offshore secrecy, et cetera, et cetera, in conjunction with other actors in the international community? Right. And that we've seen some significant steps when, you know, the Tax Justice Network was set up in 2003 and we, we called for what we call the ABC of tax transparency. So automatic exchange of information between jurisdictions about foreign bank account holders, beneficial ownership transparency. So understanding through public registers who it is that owns companies, trusts and foundations and country by country reporting by multinationals so you can see when their profits are being declared in places other than where their activity takes place. But when it comes to um, foreign aid, I mean, how is that going to make any difference? So the key thing there, it's the A and the B. It's having information exchange between jurisdictions and it's having transparency about who owns the legal vehicles that we put in place in order to create opacity. Who really owns companies, trusts and foundations? Who owns bank accounts? That information is crucial to tax systems around the world working effectively. And it, it, it's, a, sorry, sorry to interrupt, Alex, um, but, Will, I know you've spent many hours, days, weeks, months just trawling through financial documents in your work as an investigative reporter. It's very time consuming. It's very difficult. And the moment that you find something that uh, you think uh, exposes them, those people who are hiding this money will find another way of making it remain secret. Yeah, there's, there's some remarkable tricks. And uh, you're always, uh, in a sense, uh, admiring of the ingenuity that people come up with in order to uh, steal this money. But I'd underline what Alex was saying there, that um, wherever you have uh, a, a political elite uh, stealing money, not far behind him, you'll have a, a smiling Western consultant, lawyer, accountant, uh, fund manager of some sort, um, providing the methods for that stealing, the ones setting up the shell companies, the ones setting up the bank accounts, the ones drawing up bogus contracts. Uh, so, so would consultancy stopping them in the way that uh, tax laws are being investigated, uh, would stopping those facilitators, if you like, end the problem? Well, it may not end the problem, but it'll certainly uh, decrease the size of the problem. Mm. Um, when money is stolen in uh, countries that require aid, those people who are stealing it aren't spending it in those countries. They often are taking it to London, Miami, New York, uh, and spending it there. Uh, the case of Equatorial Guinea, you saw um, Teodorin Obiang uh, with a whole fleet of supercars that he was driving around the US and other places. That uh, kind of thing can be limited quite significantly if that money can't be spent. So can we? Um all three of you, in the context of what we've discussed, decide whether, and I'm exaggerating here slightly, 90% of aid going to where it should do um, is a good thing, an acceptable thing, and something with which we have to uh, put up. Uh, Salvador first. Yeah, I think 90%, um, but certainly the percentage could still be higher. And I think one of the missing elements in our discussion is the idea of increasing accountability. And recent research in foreign aid development, um, in foreign aid and development studies, is that one way of increasing that is making sure that there's a lot of other civil society stakeholders 
who are actually overseeing how foreign aid is being used in recipient countries and also how foreign aid is being allocated on the part of donor countries. Particularly in the case of healthcare, as well as in education, there are a lot of benefits that uh, foreign aid has actually um, cost in, in recipient countries. So foreign aid is not all that bad, but there are certain sectors such as education and public health that actually delivered tangible and yeah. tangible positive outcomes. So, so, so let me go to you, Will. Um, there's Salvador talking about outside actors trying to hold people uh, more to account. We've got the Common Select Committee on Foreign Aid here in the UK, which has launched an investigation. Is that the kind of examination that might right the ship slightly, for want of a better phrase? Uh, certainly it will help. Um, I think actually being on the ground and monitoring how the money is being spent, where it's been sent, is uh, the only way that you can really do this and really ensure um, that it's not stolen. But again, I'd underline the rate is low. And I, I think actually, despite the controversies at the World Bank, this is a good news story about the fact that <laughs> uh, aid money is not being lost as much as, okay. for example... It, it's low as a proportion, but it's not low in terms of the total amount of money. Let's just go through some of the figures here. Uh, the US, $95 per person. The UK, $280 per person. This is in terms of its own population. Germany, 214 The UK, $13.4 billion. This adds up to hundreds of billions of dollars, if not maybe a, a trillion dollars. I, my maths isn't, isn't that great. So is it a flawed system, Alex, that we have to live with? Can it be changed? Should it be changed? There's a bit of a risk here, I think. As you say, we have good numbers on, on aid, and we know it's a couple of hundred billion dollars a year. That's that's it, right? There's a risk that we're looking under the lamppost for our keys like a drunk who knows his keys are actually on the other side of the street, but it's dark over there. In fact, the much bigger numbers that we lose, a couple of hundred billion dollars a year, a year in lost revenues to offshore tax evasion, and five or six hundred billion dollars a year to profit shifting by multinational companies, that's where we should really be looking. But happily... But doesn't... The isn't there something the same, much the more galling thing. about the fact that somebody in a very poor country is losing money rather than a government's tax system? Ah, well, so those numbers I've mentioned, the 200 and the five or $600 billion, those numbers are disproportionately borne by lower-income countries, and the benefits, if there are any, come to high-income countries. So actually, just as, as with aid, the losses are in the same place. But we know the answers are the same. So we can fix all these things together if we want to. We can have automatic exchange of information about foreign bank accounts, and we can end the scourge of anonymous companies, trusts and foundations, simply by requiring that information to be in the public domain. OK, well, one of the suggestions in the UK is that um, foreign aid is given directly only if it benefits the UK uh, in visible ways. Now, wouldn't it be a lot simpler all round if instead of sort of saying, well, look, we're going to give you this money and you can do whatever you want with it, we actually said, sorry, we do need to see uh, where it's being spent, what is happening with it and what we get back out of it? Well, I, I think um, there, there is always a, a, a risk that you'll never stamp this out. But Alex is right. If all of the information is um, provided in all of these secure, secrecy jurisdictions, it's much harder um, to, to steal. And a, a lot of monitoring is already done by aid organizations uh, to see the accounts and how that money is spent and where it is spent and actually see the tangible results of the money. Uh, OK, so, so not a perfect system, but uh, better than no system at all. I'll come back to you, Salvador, because I think we've got the line, line again. Um, wouldn't it be better simply to say, look, we're giving you this money, we need to see something in return. In other words, we're buying a product with what we're giving you. Yeah, so I think it's um, it's a question of who will actually determine whether the outcomes of foreign aid has been delivered, right? And I do think that both the governments as well as the civil society stakeholders and representatives from the vulnerable populations in recipient countries should actually take this... Um, should actually make this a much more democratic discussion on what kind of outcomes are really needed in those recipient countries. And I don't think that just giving out this decision to the donor government, such as the UK government, would actually do any good to recipient countries. So I think it, we should expand the number of stakeholders and make it much more accessible and subject to scrutiny by other civil society stakeholders. Final even quick the most word, Alex. Ones. 
What we want ultimately is for all countries to be financially independent and taking good political decisions. We know that the more governments rely on revenues raised from their own people, the less corruption there is and the more inclusively money is spent. So ultimately, we need to be moving away from aid. But putting conditions on aid doesn't help that. It actually undermines governance. So in fact, giving the money freely to governments and saying prioritise this according to your people's political preferences is the best way to strengthen that okay. governance okay. and ultimately to end the need for aid. Even if some of it happens to be lost in the process, that's perhaps inevitable. But thank you very much indeed. You are our first three only remote guests. I hope it doesn't last for very long. Uh, but uh, we understand the reasons why it's much, much safer for you to be there and for me to be here. Uh, thank you very much for taking part, Will, Alex and Salvador. And thank you very much indeed for watching wherever you happen to be, whatever country you are in. Stay safe and listen to those who know better than all of us about what you should and shouldn't do. From the Roundtable team, thank you for watching. Hope to have your company next time. Goodbye.